Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to talk about balancing selection. Balancing selection is an interesting phenomenon when natural selection maintains two or more phenotypic forms in a population. So rather than natural selection favoring one phenotype over another, and over time that one phenotypic form becoming far more common or perhaps the only phenotypic form in the population, instead two or more are maintained at relatively stable frequencies. Now there are two different mechanisms that can lead to balancing selection. These are heterozygote advantage and frequency dependent selection. So let's talk about what each of these are and look at an example of each. Heterozygote advantage is when a heterozygote, an individual having one allele for each of those phenotypic forms, when they have a greater fitness than either homozygote. So again, the homozygotes would have two alleles for one of the forms or two alleles for the other form. The heterozygote has one allele for each. And because the heterozygote has a greater fitness, meaning the better ability to survive and therefore reproduce, then both of these alleles, meaning both of the forms, both of the phenotypic forms, are maintained in the population. Now these heterozygotes are often referred to as carriers. This is true only when at least one of those alleles, so one of the alternative forms of the gene encoding these two different phenotypes, when one is considered a, a disease trait. Now we see an example of both heterozygote advantage and heterozygotes being carriers in the disease sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell trait means having one allele for sickle cell anemia and one regular allele. And of course, we're talking about alleles for a specific polypeptide and hemoglobin, and when the different polypeptides are present, if you have the diseased polypeptide present, then you have sickle cell anemia. Now, so at people who have two alleles for sickle cell trait, meaning two alleles for that incorrect hemoglobin polypeptide, they have sickle cell anemia. So this is one type of homozygote. The other type of homozygote is when they have two non-sickle cell trait alleles. However, so they don't have sickle cell anemia, but they tend to be pretty susceptible to malaria. The heterozygote, on the other hand, is a carrier for sickle cell trait. They do have one sickle cell allele, but they also have one regular allele. Now that regular allele is the one that when present twice, in a person leads to, leads to susceptibility to malaria. However, these heterozygotes actually have a really big advantage because they are resistant to malaria as a result of having one of these sickle cell trait alleles, but because they don't have two, they don't have sickle cell anemia. So the heterozygotes, they don't have sickle cell anemia and they're pretty resistant to malaria which means that in regions where malaria is a common problem in populations, both of these alleles are maintained in the population. Again, at relatively stable frequencies, because when they're present in heterozygotes, they are advantageous together. But again, when you have a homozygote, so someone who has two of the same, regardless of which phenotypic form it is, then they have issues that reduce their fitness relative to the heterozygotes.
So that is heterozygote advantage. Now let's talk about frequency-dependent selection, which is another type of mechanism that maintains two or more phenotypic forms in a population. Now, the same idea is at play, and that idea is fitness. So, frequency-dependent selection is when the fitness of a specific phenotype is dependent on its frequency in the population, and specifically its frequency relative to other phenotypes in the population. A really cool example of this is with scale-eating fish. There are certain fish depicted here and here that actually live and survive. Their ecological niche is such that they eat scales off of other larger fish. Now, in the population of scale-eating fish, there are some that have the phenotype called right-mouthed, where their mouth is actually more on the right side of their face, and others that are called left-mouthed, where their mouth is more on the left side of their face. And because their mouths are not perfectly centered, but rather to the right or to the left, then they are able to attach to one of the sides of the fish whose scales are being eaten. So the right-mouthed fish <clears throat> has its mouth on the right side and thus attaches to the left side of the fish. The left-mouthed fish has its mouth on the left side and thus attaches to the right side of the fish whose scales it is eating. Now, what we actually see in practice is that when there are many, many left-mouthed individuals in a population, over time, the right-mouthed individuals will increase relative to the left mouth until they hit approximately a 50-50% frequency. With the left mouthed scale-eating fish, if the right mouth become too common, then the left mouth will become more common in the next generation. And so there's kind of a balancing act going on where the, the phenotype, where one phenotype is going to be dependent on how much of the other phenotype is present in the population. And this is, of course, because if you have a whole bunch of left-mouthed scale-eating fish and not very many right-mouthed fish, well, in the next generation, more right-mouthed fishes are going to survive simply because there is a niche for them to fill. Uh, being on this side of the fish, eating this fish's scales, if there aren't very many right mouths in the population, then this niche is going to be open for the next generation to, uh, to come and fill. And so that is why over time we see that the right mouthed fish and the left mouthed fish, they are usually at a 50 50 ratio. And when one starts to become more common, then it's going to be a little bit less common in the next generation, and then more, and then less, and then they're, they're going to kind of oscillate back and forth, but right around that 50% mark because of the frequency-dependent selection that is resulting in the maintenance of both of those forms at relatively stable frequencies, again, around 50% in the population. So that is it for today's video on balancing selection. I hope you learned a lot and thanks for watching Biology Professor.